Let's welcome uh, Graham Devine. Please join us. Good evening. Excuse me a second whilst I connect up. I think we're there. Okay. Thoughts on game design and various uses for a working time machine. My name's Graham Devine. I am the chief game wizard at Magic Leap. I'm also known as the wandering wizard at Magic Leap. Basically, my job at Magic Leap is to think about what happens when we put the device on. And to that end, I wander around and I help us think about what's it like when we put the device on inside the company and outside the company, kind of all over. And I talk about this all over the place, and that's not really what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about game design. This morning, I didn't know I was giving a talk. <laughs> so this is the first time I put these slides together. The only reason to give a speech is to change the world. I put this in front of every single talk I do, so I'm going to try and do that today a little bit more than I do often. These are my two dogs. <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I often talk about these two dogs. Everything that you need to know about level design is on this screen right now. Super Mario 1 for the NES teaches you everything right here. Mario starts on, off on the left-hand side, and you learn that he needs to walk from left to right. You need to jump up on the question marks to go get things that, you know, like extra lives and so forth. And um, that's not me. It, um, like extra lives and so forth. And it's, you need to jump on top of the enemies to go kill them. And you can jump down the pipes to go get uh, into invisible things. And you can go jump on top of the things to get mushrooms and they make you larger. And there's little secrets you can learn there. There's some hidden bricks. And everything you need to know to play that game is on that one screen. And basically, everything that you need to know about level design it's on that one screen. Everything that a lot of level designers learned, they learned from that game. So thank you. That's really my talk. Because <laughs> um, I've taught you everything I, that I know about game design. OK, I do have a little bit more. So a long time ago, when I started making games, here is my desk in 1982. This was the entirety of a game development company. One person. That was it. That's all there was. That was me. And I had my Apple IIe, and I had my, my ZX Spectrum, and somewhere on that desk there's, there's an Atari 800. I'm not quite sure where, but it's somewhere there. But uh, that, that was it. The entire dev company was right there. That was a different time. This is my first computer that I played games on, the DEG BT100. And I played games like Adventure, which was spelt wrong. <laughs> and I worked out how to stop the program and look at the Fortran source code and how the Fortran source code worked. I learned how to you know, make versions of that and assembly code and uh, you know, take that to bits. Along came the games like Zork 1, and I was doing things. I was in that house. I was in that cave. I was typing north by northwest. I was actually in the game. I was the adventurer. I was picking up you know, you know, flashlights. I was picking up feathers. I was in that maze of mirrors. I would think about those puzzles. And slowly, more games came out. And the role-playing game genre became something else. And I contributed towards that. I did more. I made the seventh guest. And the game was less about me. I now played you know, the role of Ego. That was, that, was the, that, that was the character that we called that you played in seventh guest. But there was more story. And someone said earlier today that, um, that a single game doesn't sell a platform. Seventh Guest made CD-ROM um, a platform. Just going to say that, because <laughs> it did. Um, 
But the game itself was less about you, the ego. You know, it was more about FMV and puzzles. Along came Love and Power. Better FMV, less about you, the character, more about those two characters that you saw a lot of FMV on, more about that. Clandestine, my next game, I have a huge love of Scooby-Doo. So I wanted to do a Scooby-Doo game. Couldn't get a Scooby-Doo license, did clandestine. Less and less about you, less and less about you being in a cave. You're not there anymore. You're just now watching and, and doing the puzzles to see the next bit of story unfold. And finally, my last game I did on the console, Halo Wars. Love this game. Love the characters I made for them. But I realized at the end of it, I'd made a crew aboard the Spirit of Fire that I loved. I love Serena, I love Captain Cutter, I love Sergeant Forge. Love those characters I made. But what about you at all? You know, Mass Effect. Is this the best we can do in games? No. We've gone from I'm the hero, as I was in Zork, an adventure, to I'm playing someone else. How do I get back to being me, being the hero? So let's look at some more history and two ideas, AKA the actual talk. We show this picture a lot, 1940s. People back then on newspapers doing you know, the thing. We still do that. Now we do it on smaller devices. Back then, they were reading one of basically three newspapers. This, you know, the town newspaper, the national newspaper, or the county newspaper. Now they're all like reading you know, you know, their own version of what news that they want to read or talking to the friends. It might not even be talking amongst themselves. They're doing it the, you know, at, you know, at the actual dinner table. It's not changed much except some smaller devices. These things have taken time to change. We have devices that came out that have killed atoms. When the phonograph came out in the 1920s, it killed off musical instruments people had in their houses. Before that, people had musical instruments that they had in their houses because the only way they could hear music was by making their own music and singing along to it. That's why my grandparents had musical instruments in their houses. That's why when you see old TV shows, there's generally a piano or guitar in the house and why you know, generations nowadays don't have them because we have you know, solutions for it. The phonograph killed the need to have a musical instrument because now I could play it on a record player. Along came the radio, killed the phonograph, killed the record player, more or less, record player sales, but it gave birth to a new industry, software. The record player companies stopped selling records so much, and they realized, wow, we better make money somehow, somewhere else. These radio stations were playing a lot of our records, and we're not getting any money from it, we're only, you know, we're only selling one record, so they sued you know, the um, other radio companies and sued for royalties. And thus was born the software royalty. Along came television, killed radio. And it took time, many, many years, for the television format to, you know, to become something that, that we were used to. It took time for Star Trek to become, I start out with the Starship Enterprise and everyone's happy and there's a joke about Spock, to the away mission going really wrong and, and the Starship Enterprise always being destroyed or the universe almost ending to at the end of the show, a joke between Spock, McCoy and Kirk and everything being happy again. And you knew every, every single episode would be just like this. Every single TV episode would be just like that. That somehow that would be the case. This is my first love arcades. This is where video games first started, but each, in, each video game had a very different interface had a very different way of playing the game. So generally, it was unapproachable by much else but my generation back then. You know, if you went in and played Defender, oh my god, there were so many buttons, Robotron. You know, it, it was very hard to approach that by, by the older generation. When the consoles first came along, it took a very long time for consoles to become accepted into the house. They were very popular. You think back on it, you know, but, you know the, they sold three million copies. But consoles were a hard sell. There was generally only one television set in the house. And we didn't have DVRs, we didn't have video cassette recorders. It was competing against live television. There also wasn't really a comfortable contract. We didn't yet have the controller that kind of had the same controls every single game. The controls we have now are really 
you know, the right control moves the camera, the left control moves the character, and the right trigger does the most dominant thing in the game. That's more or less how every single video game works. Back then, every single game had kind of a very different approach. And so there wasn't really yet a comfortable contract. It took us time to get there. And now, we have spatial computing. And spatial computing is very different. Magic Leap 1 comes with a control. The VR devices come with two six-dot controls, or one three-dot control, or all sorts of different controls. Every single application that I use has a different way of controlling itself. Some, do, some use gestures, some use the control, some use six-dot control, some use the buttons for this thing, some use the buttons for a different thing. There is no comfortable way you can go into any application and have expectations for, that, for how it works like you do a console game. No clear you know, you know, use of controls of how it works, because there's so many controls. On top of the, contro of the control, there's voice, and there's head pose, and there's gaze, and there's gesture. There's so many ways to control these devices. It'll take time for us to get there. And if we look to, you know, to the past of radio, television, consoles, that time might be 30 years. That's OK. That's how long it takes. So how do I get me into games? What are my game ideas that will be big in 30 years? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to share an idea with you. Now, this might be real. This might not be real. This might be something that I did before Magic Leap. This might be something I do after Magic Leap. This might be something that I'm actually doing right now. But it's top secret. I must ask you not to share this with anyone. And I'm serious. I'm just sharing it with just you. What I, you know, there is this urban legend called The Last Train. And The Last Train Urban Legend is there is a train that travels the world, and the governments know about it. They've known about it for years, as long as we've had train tracks. That they'll close down train stations. That's why train stations were often closed. And it's, it's the last train. In the last train, the train will pull in, and it'll pick up a single passenger. And that passenger is never heard from again. Occasionally, we hear from some of the passengers that do actually manage to get off. Occasionally, that does happen. But this train is known to roam the tracks all over the world. And the governments, they follow it. It's a real purpose of the men in black. UFOs are a cover-up. The train exists. So I spent some time researching the last train and thought, I want to expose this urban legend for reality. So I tracked down this container in, in Vegas. I went out to find it in the middle of the night. I sent this email out to my friends when I was back in the hotel. You know, I found this container. I went inside, and there was all these things. And I met this man called uh, um, this singer, um, Johnny Gistier. I found records, and I found comic books, and I found novels, and I found all these things. And I was, you know, my hotel room and laptop was stolen. It was terrible. And I did actually send this email. And my wife got some very strange phone calls at 4 o'clock in the morning from very concerned friends that I was going crazy. But uh, I thought, how can I make this urban legend real? The seventh guest was multimedia. It always bugged me, that term, multimedia. I didn't like it. I thought it was really wrong. I thought it was not the right term. I thought it was not the right thing. And I wanted this to be something different. Multimedia today is kind of these two things, the App Store and Steam. It's kind of these are where we get our multimedia from. But multimedia to me is more than that. It's these things, it's, it's comics, it's social, it's being on the web, it's books, it's vinyl records, it's communication with other people, it's doing everything together. It's communication amongst everything. So how can I make an urban legend real? Well, the obvious solution, of course, is to invent a time machine. Or, or actually, you know, just use a time machine. 
for all the Americans in the room, it's one of these. For all the British people, it's one of these. Um, I looked around. I saw to Johnny yesteryear, who's, um, at, um, he had no idea. He's crazy mad who had actually gotten off the train. And uh, he had, there's no such thing as time machines. So I thought, how can I invent an urban legend and insert one into history so that it really exists? I thought, I'll do a Kickstarter. I'll have a Kickstarter where I have these things. I have a book. I have a vinyl record. I have a comic book. I have a game. I have all these things. And I will sell them to you. And I will say, here is this book here, that, that, I, that, that isn't from the 1950s. Here is this comic book from the 1960s. Here is this vinyl record from the 1970s. Here is this, this, stone, you know, this stone carving that was found at the site you know, next to the golden spike. Here are all these things. Here are these mysteries to solve of this urban legend from the last train. Urban legends have existed for a long time. It doesn't take much to push one into reality. People have been doing it for a little while. There's this YouTube artist called uh, The Faking Hoaxer. And in 2011, he, he's actually off, offline now, because um, I think the government got to him. Um, but he spent a lot of time taking NASA footage um, if you find his videos on YouTube, and altering them to make it look like NASA went to Mars, and you know, you know, and NASA knew about the aliens, and the, the space shuttles were already going to the moon, and we had a vast moon base, and all, all these things, and very, very convincing. But he took also um, the um, World War II. The, um, in, in 1942, there was uh, this thing that happened in Culver City, this real event happened you know, above Culver City where there was this you know, false event that happened. Anti-aircraft guns blasted over LA. And it really happened. This actually really, really did happen. And this is the original photograph that, that came up. And there's all this footage of this thing that really happened. And it was witnessed by all these people. And so he took a, this footage and he added a little bit of CG to it. And he made it seem as if there was something more there. That maybe there was something that we should look at. Maybe there was something that's, you know, a little bit more than just a weather balloon. That movie was, of course, nothing like the 19, uh, movie that came out. And that movie was also just a completely fake movie that he did, I think. Or maybe it was real. But conspiracy theories are a way to make something that happens to you. What did you do last night? Well, I was online. I was on social media. I was trying to find out if that guy Graham was crazy or not because he was talking about this last train thing. And I have no idea if he really went to Las Vegas or not. I have no idea if that comic book is real, but I've looked it up and there's this last train guy who did this thing in the 1970s and he says he got off the train. I talked to a physicist guy that did this, that has this recording that went rambling on about time. I played this game that has clues inside it from this game designer that, that, that claims that, that, that it's real and he's really old and he's, you know, he's been making games since, you know, since the 1970s and I think he's crazy. All it takes is 90% of it to be real, 10% of it to be not real, and you have people thinking 100% of it can be real. So that's one idea. Is that multimedia? I thought that was multimedia. But I think I prefer that word to be cross-media. Because it uses all these things. And I wonder, why don't we make games that do that? Why don't we make games that actually cross everything and do these things? Is it because it's too hard? Is it because it's too difficult? Is that because it's too crazy? Then. What are games like for this thing? This thing will be everywhere. What's games like for spatial computing? I talk about this girl, um, about Ghost Girl, quite a little bit. 
Um, talked about it before, the games have changed. But I still write about the game design quite a little bit. I still continue to write game design documents for Ghost Girl. Um, so I'll talk about a little update on that game design today. For those of you who don't know Ghost Girl, Ghost Girl is a concept in Magic Leap that I use in Magic Leap to discuss spatial computing. And in Ghost Girl, these wooden cubes are real. And you have the headset on, and it's explaining how to use the wooden cubes. Uh, I'm learning to do words. I'm learning to do yes, no, maybe. In the next room in your house, you start to hear sounds and see lights. And eventually, they become so loud that you go look in the room of your house. And there standing before you is a ghost, Alice. And she's looking right at you. Because on our device, we know, you know where you're looking. And we can do that. And you're like, oh my god, there's a ghost in my house. And she points right at you, because we can do that. We can make a point right at you. And then she points beyond you, on the floor behind you. And you turn around. And there behind you on the floor it is the outline of a dead body. And you're like, why would you do that? And she's gone. And in your ear, you hear, will you help me? And you remember that you have these cubes that you can start communicating with Alice the Ghost. You never actually learn her name, but I call her Alice the Ghost. And you start to have these adventures where you are more the, you know, the assistant and she is more the doctor. And you start to have the, these ideas of um, you know, playing you know, cards and playing you know, where she does real cards. But I'll, I'll give you one just very quick example. Alice is bound to your house. And she can't go past the threshold. But every night at midnight, her brother walks past. And she comes up to you and says, will you go outside at midnight and tell my brother that I love him? And you say, yes, of course I will. And so you wait up till midnight. And you go outside. And you wait for the ghost to walk up. And you say, Alice, who's standing inside my house, she wants you to know that she still loves you. Now Alice is looking on, and the brother says, thank you. And I've made a game where you go outside your house at midnight, in the middle of the night, wearing a headset to tell a ghost that's not really there, for a ghost that lives in your house that's not really there, that, oh my gosh, this ghost that's not really there loves you. And when you're going to work the next day, what would you do? Why are you so tired? Well, I waited up to tell you know, the, you know, the brother of Alice you know, that, 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 that she still loves him. That's something you can't do on a console. That's something you can't do. That's happened to you. You're in a cave. You're in a room. That happened to you. I call that everyday adventure. And that is, I think, going to be something that becomes something that we do every single day as part of everything that we do. So conclusions. Iteration and new mediums are must. Sometimes it takes 10 years. Sometimes it takes 30 years. I don't think that's, you know, we've heard that many times today, actually, in, in all the keynotes. I'm quite pleased to hear that. I think everyone kind of insists that, oh my gosh, it must happen now. Time machines, they're really useful. If you want to insert something into the past, it's really useful. It takes time to kill atoms. It takes time for these revolutions to happen. We're still... We still use radios, we still use you know, um, TVs, we still use all these things. All these things are still useful. All these things are on revolutions. They all find uses. But it takes time for them to find their new use as we replace them. Everyday adventure will define a generation. I believe my job is now to build a foundation that allows it to happen. I do not believe that foundation will rise above the ground, but I believe it is my job to provide a firm foundation upon which the next generation of game designers can build everyday adventure. And I believe that that is why I am at Magic Leap. Change the world. Thank you.